When Caligula became emperor, there were celebrations in Rome. It was seen as a new golden age after the dark years of Emperor Tiberius. But Caligula would lead a life of debauchery and brutally murder for fun. He reveled in killing his victims slowly and painfully over days. Caligula forced families to attend their children's executions. His sadism horrified an empire. His whole aim in life as emperor was to explore the extreme limits of what he could do. He seems to have found the exercise of power very intoxicating and the desire to oppress other people very tempting. Caligula was born in 12 AD, the third son of a celebrated commander from the most powerful family in the Roman Empire. His real name, Gaius Julius Caesar, emphasized his imperial lineage. Caligula's father, Germanicus, was a war hero, posted on the empire's northern frontier. Agrippina, Caligula's mother, was the granddaughter of Emperor Augustus. She was outspoken, proud and ambitious. To curry favor with the army, Agrippina dressed her son in miniature military uniform. It was the troops who nicknamed him Caligula, meaning little boots. The child grew up amid jealousy and infighting in a family torn apart by rivalry. Germanicus's fame was a threat to his stepfather, the ruling emperor Tiberius. Agrippina and Germanicus are really uh, a very dramatic, charismatic pair whom Tiberius finds very difficult to handle because he is by nature a rather introverted, self-conscious, inhibited kind of person. In May 17 AD, Germanicus was recalled from Germany. It was a glorious return to Rome. Surrounded by prisoners and war booty, Germanicus led a triumphant procession. Riding in his chariot, the boy Caligula lapped up the adulation but the family had little time to enjoy their glory. Two years later, Germanicus was dead. His painful death had all the symptoms of poisoning. Rumors circulated that Emperor Tiberius was responsible. Egged on by massive public grief, Agrippina blamed Tiberius for her husband's murder. Agrippina was extraordinarily hot-headed and even on his deathbed, Germanicus is said to have warned her against letting go in front of people who would take it amiss and use it against her. Agrippina's hostility sealed her fate. The young Caligula watched as Tiberius turned on his family. One by one, his mother and two older brothers were arrested. They were condemned as enemies of the state and forced to commit suicide. Agrippina starved herself to death. But Caligula was spared. After his mother's arrest, he lived with his grandmother and great-grandmother, powerful Roman matrons. And at the age of 19, he was summoned unexpectedly to Capri to join Emperor Tiberius. Tiberius invited Caligula when the moment of truth struck him about the succession that all of the children of Germanicus were being picked off one by one. And if he did this, he would be betraying all the plans of Augustus for the succession. Now in his 70s, Tiberius was hated in Rome and in the Senate. His reign had been overshadowed by a series of treason trials, a method of eliminating rivals who spoke against the emperor. Leaving Rome behind, Tiberius had retired to Capri, far from public scrutiny. The island had grown notorious for debauchery and cruelty. For six years, Caligula lived here, forced to pay his respects to the man he held responsible for his family's deaths. He played the perfect guest. This was a young man who'd seen his brothers go and who'd learnt of all the dangers of talking out of turn. He had to contain his feelings and learn to present a a polite 
and subservient front on any occasion. The strain of keeping up the pretense all the time must have been absolutely appalling. But I don't think it's any sign of irrationality or paranoia on his part. I think he was simply responding rationally to an appalling situation. His whole family was a dysfunctional family. Caligula suppressed his thirst for vengeance. But according to his biographer Suetonius, he found plenty to vent his frustration on. Yet even at that time, he was not able to control his savage and reprehensible nature. Indeed, he showed the keenest interest in witnessing the sufferings and torments of those condemned to be tortured. Caligula made the most of his time on Capri, creating key alliances. He married Junia Claudia, daughter of a distinguished senator. But his most important ally was Macro, head of the Praetorian Guard and a veteran of violence. As Tiberius's right-hand man, Macro had organized the notorious trials and executions of the emperor's reign. The partnership was so strong that Macro allowed Caligula to sleep with his wife. Tiberius watched the alliance in horror, fearful for the future of his own grandson, Gemellus. But his hands were tied. As the son of Germanicus, Caligula already had the people's support. With Macro behind him, he had the army too. Reluctantly, Tiberius named his joint successors. Caligula and Gemellus were to rule together. It would never happen. Tiberius died in March 37. Guided by Macro, the Senate threw out his will on the grounds of insanity. They handed sole control of the empire to Caligula. The new emperor was just 24 years old. Insecure and highly strung, he was tall and spindly, with sunken eyes and thinning hair. Later in his reign, he was to order men with thicker hair to shave their heads. For now, Rome was elated. The crowds that greeted him were quite extraordinary. And he was greeted in the same way by the Senate. Everything went absolutely smoothly. They were falling over themselves to welcome him. Since the days of Augustus, the Roman emperor was first among equals. In their enthusiasm, the Senate handed Caligula absolute power. Caligula found himself as the leader of the Roman world and as a man with power of life over death over all of his subjects. And perhaps what makes him different from his predecessors Augustus and Tiberius is that here we have the naked display of an autocrat. Caligula and Macro capitalized on the mood of celebration. The Praetorian Guard were handed a cash bonus. The Roman people were treated to theater and games. The Senate were reassured that Tiberius's hated treason trials would stop. And to their relief, Caligula publicly destroyed papers listing his family's accusers. He promised there would be no prosecutions. No one knew there were copies. The first six months of Caligula's reign were a period of euphoria. They came at a price. In just 12 months, Caligula ran through 2.7 billion sesterces, enough to pay the army for eight years. But the golden days of fun had taken a greater toll on his health. Before the summer was over, he suffered a physical and mental breakdown. Caligula's condition sent shockwaves through Rome. Desperate for his recovery, one high-ranking Roman offered to fight gladiators if the emperor survived. Caligula did, but he was a changed man. For the rest of his life, Caligula suffered headaches and sleepless nights, pacing his palace till daylight. But it was Rome that suffered most. Caligula demanded a terrifying show of loyalty. The man who had promised he would fight as a gladiator, he obliged to fulfill his vow looking on as he struggled in combat and not letting him off until he had won his fight and pleaded repeatedly for delivery. When he was at death's door, he will have come to realize that he was not indispensable 
And when he began to recover, he would have realized that people were taking uh, measures that would uh, cover the situation in case he didn't get better. In other words, he saw people preparing for the after Caligula situation, and this was intolerable to him. Caligula lashed out at close relatives and friends as he regained his strength. Gemellus, Tiberius' grandson, was accused of hoping for the emperor's death. The 18-year-old was shown how to kill himself. Caligula turned on his father-in-law, Silenus. The old man was accused of treason. Even Macro fell foul of the emperor's anger and mistrust. Caligula had grown resentful of his mentor's advice. He charged Macro with prostituting his wife. Both committed suicide. Enya had been Caligula's mistress. Now Macro had gone, no one would hold Caligula back. At the age of 24, Caligula had been handed the reins of power. He had removed immediate threats to his position and thrown himself into an orgy of pleasure. He spent vast amounts on sports and games. Caligula came to believe that he could use his power to indulge his own pleasures and his own whims and that he could do anything to anybody. He didn't realize that if you want to stay in power, you actually have to control your emotions and your desires. Caligula built his own racing track and poisoned his rival's horses. He joked he would appoint his favorite horse to the Senate, since it was as clever as any senator. This was an intelligent man and a witty one, very well able to deal with words. Uh, the stories about him are oh, sometimes quite amusing if they didn't have victims. Caligula also had a passion for gladiators. He ordered more bloodthirsty spectacles. And to the horror of the Senate, he even joined in, killing a gladiator in a mock fight. Once, when he and a Mermillo from the gladiatorial school had been having a fight with wooden swords and the latter deliberately fell to the ground, he ran the man through with a real dagger. One year into his reign, Caligula was showing a mania for self-indulgence. Guests to his dinner parties were presented with food made of gold, while the emperor drank pearls dissolved in vinegar. His sexual appetite has gained lasting notoriety. Caligula demanded sex from prisoners, senators, and members of his family. He habitually indulged in incestuous relations with all his sisters, and at a crowded banquet, he would make them take turns in lying beneath him while his wife lay above. When Drusilla, his favorite sister, died in 38 AD, Caligula declared her a goddess. He placed her statue in the Temple of Venus, goddess of love. Caligula was obsessed by women he could not have. We don't know whether he was really particularly highly sexed, but what we do know is that he liked summoning women away from their husbands, debauching them and then returning them. This is clearly a, a power thing. After his first wife died in childbirth, Caligula snatched his second wife at her wedding to another man. He divorced her within weeks. His third wife was married too. The emperor forced her husband to give her away. But in his fourth wife, Caesonia, Caligula found his soulmate. She was promiscuous and extravagant. Caligula was delighted, parading her naked in front of his friends. But even she was not safe. When Caligula kissed her neck, he told her he could cut it whenever he wanted. She bore him his only child, Drusilla, named after his sister. Less than two years after his ecstatic reception, the emperor's behavior was causing alarm in the Senate. By early AD 39, there were stirrings of resistance. Caligula's response was to unleash terror. Marching into the Senate, he branded them hypocrites who turned against Tiberius and would turn against him. Now he revealed he'd kept copies of lists of his family's enemies, despite his promise. 
There was panic as he accused everyone of involvement in his family's deaths. Caligula's attitude towards the Senate was one of complete contempt. Now the gloves are completely off. The facade of a Roman emperor who takes advice and listens to his Senate is well and truly over. Terrified, the Senate agreed to a resumption of the treason trials. It's a stage in his deterioration, a very, very marked stage, and I think a fatal one, because you couldn't do without the Senate. You might kill X number of senators, and his successor killed a number of senators too, but you can't do without the Senate as a whole, and he alienated them. Caligula's purge was indiscriminate. Throughout his reign, the emperor took a keen interest in inflicting death. He issued precise instructions. Prisoners should be killed slowly by a series of small cuts. Executioners were told victims must feel their deaths. Caligula's evil shows in his desire to make people suffer. We're told that he uh, was torturing a man for so long that his brains began to putrefy and to smell. Another victim claimed he was innocent. The execution was stopped. Caligula ordered soldiers to cut out his tongue. Then they killed him. The emperor was often present, even dining during the ordeal. He also insisted the victim's families join him. One father pleaded that he was too ill to attend. Caligula sent a litter to his house to collect him. As Caligula indulged his sadism to the hilt, members of the Senate even found themselves ordered into the gladiator's ring. The arena was a perfect place for Caligula to humiliate his Senate because all of the citizen body would be there, watching and being watched. Caligula was very much a sadist. He enjoyed at the lightest teasing people and at the worst actually torturing them. And this is a society which itself is extremely statistic, a society which loved gladiatorial shows, wild beast hunts, the massacre of prisoners, and yet they were shocked by this man's behavior, partly I suppose because he was exercising his sadism on his fellow citizens. But it was itself, the ingenuity of it, was shocking to them. As Caligula's abuse of the Senate continued, shock turned to public unrest. Furious, he ordered the awnings of the theater drawn back to punish the angry crowd. They roasted in the midday sun. As opposition escalated, so did the violence. Even close relatives came under attack. Claiming to have uncovered a conspiracy, Caligula exiled his surviving sisters and had his brother-in-law put to death. In the first three years, Caligula's impact was confined to Rome. By late 39 AD, he had raised his sights. Caligula needed military success. He'd been brought up in the camp, but he'd never seen an army. And one of the most important functions of a Roman emperor was to be a general. That's what the word emperor ultimately means. And he had to live up to that. Unlike his father Germanicus, Caligula was no soldier. But he believed he could exceed Germanicus's reputation and extend the empire into Britain. Caligula marched in comfort, accompanied by his troops and gladiators, crossing the German border early in 40 AD. After minor skirmishes, he fled in panic from an enemy attack. Now he switched his attention to Britain. What happened next defies military logic. On reaching the English Channel, Caligula set out to sea. But, as his biographer Dio reports, he promptly returned to shore. He took his seat on a lofty platform and gave the soldiers the signal as if for battle, bidding the trumpeters urge them on. Then, all of a sudden, he ordered them to gather up the shells. Caligula's elite forces picked up shells in their helmets. They were sent back to Rome for display as the spoils of victory over the ocean. His behavior remains a mystery. Certainly, his dreams of conquest had come to nothing. On returning to Rome, 
he tested the Senate's loyalty to the utmost, demanding they treat him as a god. Earlier emperors had been worshipped after death. Caligula was not prepared to wait. Playing with the idea of being a god does seem to show a childlike idea of having everything now and everything before he's ever earned it. He ordered a temple to be built to himself in the heart of Rome. Wealthy nobles, including his uncle Claudius, were forced to pay vast sums to join. By now, Caligula's irrational demands were threatening the stability of his empire. When he ordered his own statue to be placed in the Temple of Jerusalem, there was outrage in the Jewish population. It was the ultimate insult to the Jewish god. Fearing major riots, the local governor stalled, risking his own life. But before the statue was finished, the emperor was dead. Caligula had received dramatic proof that he was not divine. As he returned from the theater on the 24th of January, 41 AD, Caligula was stabbed to death. The assassins included members of his family and the Praetorian Guard assigned to protect him. Caligula was killed because there was no other way to get rid of him and no apparent end to the evils he was prepared to perpetrate. There was an ancient theory that if a man was evil enough, his soul was so corrupt, the only way you could cure him was to kill him. The corpse was left with more than 30 wounds. His wife, Caesonia, was hunted down and stabbed. Drusilla, their two-year-old daughter, was beaten to death against a wall. The Roman world thought that it was relieved of a monster. Uh, the horror of what he'd done between the year he came to power and the moment of his assassination was astounding. Convinced he too was on the hit list, Caligula's uncle Claudius was found shaking behind a curtain. To his amazement, he was marched to the Praetorian camp and acclaimed as emperor. Once again, there was rejoicing in the Senate and Caligula's statues were torn down. Everything was done to obliterate his memory and his successor Claudius actually referred to him as being out of his mind. I don't think that Caligula was out of his mind at all. This was a young man who was absolutely determined to use every freedom he had. Caligula had reigned for just three years and 11 months.